Spirit, let's all stand as we begin our worship service. I'm so glad that you could be here with us. We're going to start off here by singing Higher Ground. I'm pressing on the other way. Sing it here. I'm pressing on the upper way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Fill me with your heart and lead me in 
build my life. Take out your worship guide. You find one of those around you in your seats there. And we'll notice uh, several, several announcements here uh, today. And I'm thankful that you're here. And those of you that are guests with us this morning, thank you for worshiping uh, the Lord with us. There are many of you. And uh, I am uh, delighted to uh, lift up the Lord with you uh, in, in one voice. And so we have got uh, Children's Church will be here in a moment, uh, right before uh, the message. That will be uh, fifth grade and uh, below. Uh, Sarah will go out uh, here in a few moments. And so if you uh, would like your children to be a part of that, they certainly uh, may. Uh, but this coming Saturday, uh, we have a fall church cleanup and I moved that to 9 a.m. So if you were planning, originally it was at 10, but moved that up to 9 a.m. There's going to be indoor things that needed to be done as well as outdoor. So uh, there will be something for everyone if you uh, do have some time uh, this coming Saturday uh, to just get the place spruced up. We're going to, uh, in, the, in the back of the property, we're going to be cutting a lot of shrubs. And so you fellows, it would be great to uh, have a lot of help with that. And then next Sunday, I'm excited to be uh, starting at 10 o'clock. So this is, of course, our 11 o'clock hour. 10 o'clock next week, we're going to start a six-week men's and ladies split Bible studies. And so we did that uh, about a month and a half ago, and uh, it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful time. We're going to do it again uh, for the next six weeks. And I will be teaching on uh, just the topic of the fear of and uh, we will be looking at multiple different things that, that we tend to fear. Uh, but one would be the fear of the Lord. That's a proper fear. The fear of man and a lot of other uh, different areas. And then uh, Sarah will be taking the ladies through uh, the book of Ruth. And to really kind of prepare us for uh, Christmas. So it's going to be uh, exciting for you ladies there. And so that's at 10 o'clock starting uh, next week. And then you can see the next MOPS meeting, Mothers of Preschoolers, is on uh, the 18th, a Thursday night, 7 p.m. And then the next IF Ladies Gathering, uh, with just coffee and tea and uh, just wonderful conversation. That is on Saturday on the 20th at 9 a.m. And then on the 21st, mark your calendar for our Thanksgiving night of worship. Uh, normally we just have morning services on that particular Sunday. We'll have the 10 o'clock, the 11 o'clock, and then at 5.30 we'll gather over in our fellowship hall and chapel and have a wonderful evening uh, fellowship. We'll have a sign-up sheet starting for that next week. And uh, for uh, we'll have food as well, and it's just going to be a great time. We also will be partaking of the Lord's Table. Uh, in that service and so I'm excited about that and then uh, you can see some other upcoming things when it uh, comes to December the next home group and then even our Christmas candlelight service on that 19th of 
of December. So hopefully you can uh, mark your calendar uh, for these items here. Mike? Sing our final song here this morning before we get into the message. Uh, we're going to sing here, Heal Our Land. And take our lives flawed yet beautiful. You take our lives flawed yet beautiful. may be seated. Uh, children, you can be dismissed to Children's Church. You can just follow uh, Sarah there. First Peter chapter number three, please. First Peter three. And uh, I'm glad that you are uh, gathered with us to, to worship the Lord today. First Peter chapter number three. Uh, last time I was up here was two weeks ago in the middle of our 
what was it called? Some kind of cyclone, cyclops, or whatever it was. And the power went just straight out. And so hopefully we will have uh, power throughout the course of our uh, service today. But First Peter chapter 3, we've been in a series, verse by verse, through this book that we entitled Between Two Worlds. Uh, we are living in the world as we look to the next. And it really is, it really is a paradox. And uh, we are um, left here after salvation to honor and glorify God with our lives, uh, even in uh, the midst of the world around us. Let's begin reading in verse number 13. I alluded to these last week, uh, way of conclusion of our outdoor barbecue. That was fun. In verse 13, and who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation or your good lifestyle in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. I'm really praying that the Lord will use, we're going to actually spend a few weeks, two weeks actually in this text, but I've entitled the message this morning, Hope Against Hostility. Hope, you see that even in, in the midst of it, verse number 15, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you of the reason of the hope that is in you. And so hope amidst hostility. And I want to start by asking you a question. Everyone awake, alert, alive, we're good. Are you ready? That was the question. Are you ready? No, I'm just kidding. Are you ready to suffer? Are you ready to suffer? See, for many of us in America, honestly, I think our answer to that is no. But for many of the Christians around the world, that answer is yes. I am and I have and I am continually ready. John Piper said Christianity was born in a world of totalitarianism. It was not strange to be persecuted. What is strange historically is that we are not. That's what's strange. For the first 300 years, Christians had no legal protection in the Roman Empire. To become a follower of Jesus meant risking everything those first 300 years or so. In many parts of the world, following Jesus means that we face open persecution. So let me give you just a few current examples. The heading, two Christians killed, dozens abducted in the attack on a church in Nigeria. It goes on to say, two Christians were killed in an attack on a church service in the southern Kudana state on Sunday, October 31st. That was one week ago. With eight others slain in earlier assaults on Christian villages. The lethal attack on Baptist worshipers in the Daji village in Jakun County also resulted in the kidnapping of dozens of Christians from the Sunday service, the church leader said. A medical doctor and pastor who headed a Christian ministry in northeast Nigeria was shot to death on October 14th. Dr. Hablina Solomon, the president of the Charity and Hope Ministry based in, in the village Jaru Yina, again, I'm struggling, of course, with this, with the, um, with the language of it, was killed at his home in the village by Muslim Fulani herdsmen, according to the the, the pastor who was based in this northeast Nigeria region. According to the U.S.-based persecution watchdog group International Christian Concern, at least 17 Egyptian Christians have gone missing in Libya since September 30th. They go on to say, this is a frightening time for Egyptian Christians, regardless of whether their family or friends are among those missing. Claire Evans who's the regional manager for the Middle East, added, the memory of ISIS marching Christians down a Libyan beach to their death runs deep. 
It was an event that was traumatic for all Egypt's Christians, an event that held serious implications for everyone. Of course, the Haitian-American pastor who was kidnapped by armed men dressed as police officers earlier in October, he has been released. However, 17 American and Canadian missionaries continue to be held hostage by the notorious 400 Mawazo gang. So how many Christians or how many persecuted Christians are there? Well, most experts, they suggest that there are some 200 million Christians worldwide that suffer persecution for their faith, with another 200 to 400 million who face discrimination in some form for simply being a Christian. So we live in this freedom, and we who live in this freedom, we we must pray for these individuals. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And here what I'm about to say, we have more common with, it, with them with those un, than our unconverted American friends and relatives. Some of you may recognize the name of Graham Staines. Randy Alcorn tells this story. On January 23rd of 1999, Graham and his two sons, Philip, who was 11 years old, and Timothy, 6 years old, were murdered by a large mob of militant Hindus. They had gone to a Christian camp in the jungle where Graham was ministering. At midnight, the mob attacked, setting fire to the jeep in which Graham and his sons were sleeping. They were burned alive. When the fire finally cooled, they found the charred body of Graham Staines with his arms wrapped around the bodies of his sons. The response of Gladys, his wife, and his daughter Esther was on the front page of every single newspaper in India. Gladys, his wife, said, I have only one message for the people of India. I'm not bitter. Neither am I angry. But I have one great desire, that each citizen of this country should establish a personal relationship with Jesus Christ who gave his life for their sins. She goes on to say, let us burn hatred and spread the flame of Christ's love. Many people were surprised when Gladys decided to stay ministering in this town. She explained that her decision for, for why she was staying this way. My husband and our children have sacrificed their lives for this nation. India is my home. I hope to be here and continue to serve the needy. When asked the, uh, the, the daughter, Esther, of how she felt about her father and her brothers being murdered, her, her response, listen, it's almost like it came out of the book of Acts. She says, I praise the Lord that he found my father worthy to die for him. May God grant us a generation of children and teenagers and young adults and older adults with that kind of faith, with that kind of courage. There's no pastor in the world that's going verse by verse through 1 Peter that wouldn't want to punt on this text. But I want to do justice to it. We're going to just continue to go down through this book as, as we're just trying to be faithful to it. And I want to ask you, are you prepared to suffer for Christ? And see, the reason why that I'm asking that question is so that if and when that time does come, you will have the answer already in your heart and in your mind. And so as we look into our text today, I want you to put this, this truth, these truths deep in your mind so that you will have it later. Because we're not facing what the world is facing uh, now. Is it, is it coming? Is it on a horizon? Are we seeing more and more? Sure we are. But there is really no e e equalness with this. And so we're going to need this later if the Lord so tarries. The planet has always been highly dangerous. I think we know that. But it has never been more dangerous than now in some ways. Children along with their parents, they, they, they face a very troubled world, a very hostile world, hostile to families, to marriages, ultimately down to the children. We're also facing the fact that in our lifetime, this is the first time that true Christians seem to have become public enemy number one. 
around our globe. And the system is coming at us with fierceness that we probably can't necessarily look back and see it the same. Never in the history of the world have we been so exposed as much as we are today. Oh, there's always been trouble. There's there's always been evil. Even Job said in Job 5 verse 7, yet man is born unto trouble. we're, We're born into it. Jesus said in, in the upper room in John 16, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. But in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And so we, we know that trouble has always existed, but we've never personally, let me say this, listen carefully, we've never personally had to deal with it so much as we do right now. Now in this multi-saturated media type of age, we have to now take on everybody else's troubles down to the smallest detail. It used to be the trouble that you knew of was the trouble that you experienced. Or the trouble that you knew of was the trouble maybe that someone else told you that they had experienced or told you about. Or Maybe it was maybe the next day where you opened up a newspaper if you had access to that newspaper. But now, we all carry all of the troubles of the whole world in detail because it's ever before us with social media, everything constantly before us. We always know what is going on. I think it was a couple of weeks ago in our, in our prayer time, someone brought up the the, 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 the Haitian pastor, the American pastor that was um, kidnapped in, in Haiti. And it was like literally just breaking news, right, that morning. So it's always before us. And I'll be honest with you, it's more than a heart can bear. It's intimidating. It frightens us. And it can create great anxiety and fear amongst us. We also live with all of the doomsday prophecies as well. We have to deal with natural disasters. We're constantly being warned about some kind of new flu, some kind of bug, some kind of new virus or bacteria or some strain of a disease. And by the way, that was all prior to COVID, right? It's just our natural cycle. There is a general evil seeming to escalate. Even Paul spoke to it when he was writing to his young apprentice, Timothy, that that evil men, they're going to get worse and they're going to get worse. Corruption and perversion and crime and terrorism. We're all exposed to it at all times. How many of you want to just go home and get under the covers? Welcome to my long introduction this morning. (laughs) It's a long one. And then when we get to actually a point, trust me, we're going to be landing the plane, okay? Now, all of this should actually be no surprise to Christians because we ought to understand actually what the Bible says. We ought to understand what the Bible has actually promised that would happen. In Job 14, verse 1, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. David says to God in the Psalms, be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. This was his cry. There's no one here to help me. Isaiah said, and they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. That is the life that we live on a dangerous, fallen planet. But God is in control of this planet. He's in full control. We read in Psalm 96 that the very sea can rejoice. The planet can praise. The trees, they can sing out for joy because they're under the control of their creator. Read Psalm 96. It's awesome. But verse number 10 says this, Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. See, so the world that is in chaos, the world that has always known trouble since the fall of man, it's natural ecosystem as we know it is not going anywhere until God comes to bring it to an end. doesn't mean that we should harm it just for harm's sake. No. But listen, God is in control of all this. He's in control of this world. He's in control of even the ecosystem around us. And no matter how hard we try, it's God's timeline. 
This is God's world around us. He alone will end it because God is in control. And even further, God is not only in control, but God is in even the trouble. He is in the trouble fulfilling His purposes. We had a great uh, home group on Friday night, and we were tackling this concept of the fact that God exists and evil exists. Wonderful conversations and back and forth and challenging questions, and we're seeing it play right before us again even in our text of First Peter and these uh, other texts. Isaiah 14 says, The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. I have purposed, so it shall stand. That's what God says. He's purposed it, so it will stand. Isaiah 46 says, Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do of my pleasure. So be confident that God is in the trouble. He is under, he's, 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 not, he's not absent from you in your trouble. But He's not necessarily going to explain everything to you in your trouble. Sometimes we want God to explain everything, right? Sometimes we want to ask God why, and we want the answer. Listen, there's a very important principle in Isaiah 45, verse 15. Verily thou art God that hidest himself. O God of Israel, the Savior. The specific purposes of God are not, hear me, always known to us. For example, Job, he has no idea why God allowed Satan to do what Satan did to him. The whole book's about kind of more so through the friends asking, why, why, why? No answer. But by the end he says, but I know that my Redeemer liveth. And so God doesn't always answer. God was for sure controlling the trouble in Job's life. But he never told him why. The Bible tells us, tells us only what we need to know and God determines that. And most of the time, or a lot of the time, the, what the, the trouble that we experience in the world, God remains silent on it. We ask why and we don't, we don't get an answer. But we do know what He wants from us in the trouble. He tells through James, He tells us through James in James 1, that we are to count it all joy when we fall into these types of troubles and persecutions and struggles in our life. Why? Because it's for the perfecting of the saints. It's for the working of what God is trying to do in our lives. These troubles, they wean us from this world. There was a question on Friday night of why does God allow some things to happen to some people and not to others? God has the power to be able to stop evil. Why doesn't He stop the evil? And that's a loaded question with a loaded answer. And there's multiple, multiple answers to that question. But one of the answers is, is God wants you to long for eternity. And if everything was always okay down here, guess what? We really wouldn't be longing for eternity. But one of the reasons why we suffer and the things that we go through, all of that is going to pale in comparison, Paul says, to the glory which we will experience when we go to heaven. And so it weans us from this world, just as you wean that baby from its mother's milk at some point. Trials and suffering, we don't always want to stay here. We want to go to the next. We're kind of living between these two worlds. Right? We're living now, but but we're longing for the next. They drive you to prayer. I'll be honest with you, sometimes we're on the mountaintops, we're not always great praying saints. But when we're in that valley, you know what we're doing? We're praying. We're getting others to pray. Hey, hey, can you pray for me? I've got this struggle. Why? Because that trouble has brought an awakening of your need for God. That's that's a good thing. It drives you to a dependence on God. They make you able to comfort others in their troubles. When you've gone through something and you've come out victorious, you're able to walk alongside another person and say, hey, I've been through this. There's lots of positive spiritual benefits to trouble. But let's dig 
into one specific category of trouble. We ready? Persecution. Because as I was saying earlier, there's this new kind of trouble for us that you can just see. It, it, it's happening more and more in our country. It has been known in many parts of the world nonstop. But for us, we have a kind of a bit of a reprieve for a few hundred years, so to speak. But now true gospel Christianity seems to be at the top of the list of offenses against this free and immoral society. So the question for us this morning is how do we respond not just to trouble, but to persecution? When that trouble goes beyond just the difficulties of life to now you're being persecuted for your, according to our text in First Peter, your righteousness sake, for you doing what is right. Well, in John 15 in the upper room, Jesus says, he's like, listen, they hated me. <laughs> They're going to hate you. They did all kinds of evil things against me. As soon as you take the name of Christian and you live loudly for Christ, that's why I think sometimes we like to be really, really, really quiet. But you live loudly for Christ, loudly for Jesus. Hey, they hated you. They're going to hate, they, they, they hated me. They're going to hate you. They persecuted me. They're going to persecute you. He says, don't expect anything different. We have been so blessed these years of our country. I mean, just so blessed to have the freedoms that we have. We ought to be thankful for it, and we ought to use them. I'm glad you're here using the freedom today. It's a blessing. But listen, it might not always be the case. If they mistreated me, he says, they're going to mistreat you. So that was a very long introduction to our text that we're going to actually spend in the next two weeks. You are not going to hear anything that's new. Nothing will be new today. But I do hope that I'm going to bring up some things that are renewed in your thinking. And the reason why is because I'm watching Christians, including myself, become anxious, fearful, angry, irritated, hostile. And I want to tell you that if that's our responses now, it's going to get a lot worse. Aren't you guys glad you came to church today? I wanted to punt just as much as you wanted me to punt. So, But we need to hear. We need to hear what Peter says. Because I'll be honest with you, if the last year and a half have made us this is nothing compared to what could be coming. Alright? The truths that will be in this text over the next couple of weeks I believe, can comfort us. They can give us confidence, hope, and peace in the midst of persecution as it escalates. And so, where does it start? All right, again, this is not going to be anything, anything new. You need a passion for goodness. That's where it starts. That's where Peter starts. You need a passion for goodness. Look at verse number 13 again. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good. This is the first line of defense against persecution, against evil aggression. It's just, it's just an obvious idea here. It's not some profound heavenly doctrine. People have a hard time hurting those that are good. It is unusual for, for people who are hostile to mistreat people who are passionate about doing good. The world is slow to hurt people who are a benefit to their society, who are helpful, who are compassionate, kind, caring, merciful. Peter says, again, it's nothing, it's nothing just amazing heavenly doctrine. He's like, start here. Start with having a passion for what is good. The good life is hard to harm. The life of a, of a person that is caring and compassionate and helpful, it's hard to harm that person. So don't get bitter. Don't get defensive, right? All the weeks leading up to this, all of the, we're not supposed to give evil right back. All right? Don't get self-protective. Don't get overly angry because things are intruding on your freedoms, passions, and on your comfort. Just 
keep doing what is good. Maybe I can add a little light to this. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, please. 1 Thessalonians 5. We'll come back to this, but 1 Thessalonians 5. We doing okay? I love church. Too bad I'm not barbecuing burgers for you today like last week. That would have kind of gone over a little bit better. Hey, let me... Here's a burger. You'll have to go get your own burger. But I'm just trying to be faithful to the text. I love you all enough to do that. 1 Thessalonians 5, look at verse number 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and and to all men. Always seek after that which is good, both for one another, believers, and for non-believers, for everyone. Just find the path of goodness. That's hard if that heart is full of bitterness and wrath. It, it, it's hard. I mean, th- this, whole, this whole text is difficult because it's so countercultural. It's so otherworldly. But we're living in this world seeking the next. We have the power for the next in the person of Jesus Christ. It's very hard for people to harm you is what Peter is saying. The word harm in 1 Peter 3 here, it comes from uh, that, that, the, the Greek root which means evil. It is hard for people to do evil unto those that are passionate for goodness. Start there in your life. Don't let the persecution, don't let the hostility, the, the anti-Christian ways, the overpowering corruption that is going on, that's happening in our world, don't allow it to direct you towards vengeance and animosity and hostility. What Peter is saying here, and again, we're going to look, got to remember who he's writing to. He's writing to people that are being persecuted for the fact that they say, I'm a Christian. And he's saying, don't let that drive you to give evil for evil. Don't. Instead, seek goodness. Let your passion be for what is good. John Siri, he was right when he said this, no heart is pure that is not passionate. Fall in love with goodness. Commit your life to what is good to all people. Not just believers, not just brothers and sisters in Christ, but to all people. And so when people see that you are compassionate, caring, generous person, All Peter is saying is it's harder for that person to condemn or to harm you. The opposite of this would be to be scandalous behavior, self-centered, braggadocious, manipulative by people who name the name of Christ. shouldn't be that way. We need to be known as those who do good. All right, so be passionate about goodness. Let me give you the second one, and it's the last one for today. We ready? You need a willingness to suffer. Oh, man, too bad I couldn't make a burger right now and make you feel better. You need a willingness to suffer. Verse 14, just the beginning. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you. So let's assume that you're doing what is good. You're a benevolent person. You're kind. You're generous. You're totally unselfish. You know what could still happen? You could still suffer for the sake of that goodness. Now, notice how it begins. It says, but and if, or when, if. In in the Greek, it's in the mood of a possibility without a definite time. The old English word that we would get from it would be perchance. It means that there is a chance you could get persecuted anyway. Listen, lots of people have been very, very good and they're still persecuted. The people that Peter was writing to were in fact this type of people. It was happening to them. They were suffering for the sake of righteousness, uprightness, for godly behavior. Turn to 1 Peter 4. So kind of go back. 
will be here in a couple weeks. But look at verse number 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, though as some strange thing happened unto you. When you put these Gospels kind of on top of each other on, on like a calendar, this is literally when like the Christian, like Rome's on fire and they're being blamed for it. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Yes, it's harder to, to harm someone because they're good. That's what Peter's saying, just simply. But it can happen. It does happen. And oh, by the way, early Christians here, it is happening to you. So don't be surprised. God is, he's, he's in the suffering. He is in control. He's there with you every step of the way. He is there to strengthen you. In fact, it's a real privilege to be counted worthy to suffer. Look at verse number 13 of, of chapter 4. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So if you are to accept the suffering when it comes, and you rejoice to be able to be suffer along with Christ, listen, there is a great reward that comes with that. But there needs to be a willingness. Now turn back to chapter 2, staying in 1 Peter. Verse 21. We've already looked at this concept because we've gone verse by verse through this. For even hereunto, verse 21 of 1 Peter 2, were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Verse 22. Who did no, did, did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. See, Christ's death was absolutely redemptive for us. It was to, it was to buy our salvation so that we could be right with God once again, so we could be reconciled. Jesus Christ absolutely did that, was, came to redeem us, but it was also to be our example. He not only died in our place, He not only was bearing the punishment of God for our sins, but He showed us how to suffer unjustly. So again, listen, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. If you're suffering because you're doing bad, Peter's like, eh, eh, that, that's on you. But if you're suffering for doing right, Jesus always did right. He was tempted like we are, yet without sin, Hebrews tells us. And so, listen, he showed us how to suffer unjustly. He gave us an example. And that example is, don't get angry. Don't get hostile. Don't become vengeful. But instead, commit yourself to God. Keep your eyes on God. Submit yourself to His rule and His reign. Listen, we think it's out of control. God is fully aware of everything that's going on. So how do you face the hostile world ahead of you? You face it with a passion for goodness. And that is going to make it more difficult for people to persecute you. But if it does come, be willing to suffer because the eternal outcome, it's so wonderful. John Bunyan, he was, uh, he's the author of Pilgrim's Progress. If you haven't read that, I encourage you to read it. But as he wrote that, wonderful classic. He was in the Bedford jail and he was allowed to walk out any day that he wanted if he would simply renounce the gospel. He had a wife, he had kids. And I said, hey, if, if, if you'll just renounce the gospel, if you'll just renounce Christ, you are a free man. He said that it would have made his conscience a slaughterhouse to do so. And he wrote a poem while he's in this prison. He says, this prison, very sweet to me, has been since I came here. And so would also hanging be if thou didst then appear. Bunyan is saying, this, this prison has been a blessing to me. And even if I hung 
for what I stand for would mean I'm that much closer to you. Hey, American, are we, are we ready to suffer? <laughs> no. Christians around the world, yeah, we have. We are. And we need to be praying for them. But we need, again, we need now to determine that we're going to be Christians who are courageous, bold, righteous, holy, zealous for good. And if persecuted, we're going to rejoice in the special glory that God gives when that happens. I can't tell you precisely what is going to come in the future against us. I don't, I, I, I don't know what's going to come. I'm not a prophet. I, I don't know. But it's most likely going to come and it's going to escalate. Is it going to happen in our lifetime? I, I don't know. We're seeing it for sure come more and more now than we ever have before. What forms is it going to be in? I don't know. Persecution is going to come against you as an individual when you are an outspoken Christian. So here you are. You're here in this hostile world. You're an alien. You're, 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 you're a stranger, like chapter 1 talks about. You're just sojourning. You're between worlds, right? Where, where we're longing for the next, but God's left you here for a reason, for a function. You have a task, and this task is not just to survive, although some weeks we feel like, if I can just survive, I, I get that. Your task is not to somehow to defeat the enemy. No, 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 Jesus already did that. Jesus completely defeated the enemy on the cross. Oh, it doesn't look like they're defeated now. Trust me, evil has been defeated. Someday, perfect justice is going to be spelled out perfectly by God. And so your job and my job is not to somehow defeat the enemy. You want to know what your job and my job is? It's actually to win the enemy to our side. Now, what do I mean by our side? To a belief in Christ. That's what we've been left here to do. You do that by keeping your behavior honest and excellent. You do that by being a shining light in a world so that men can see your good works and glorify the Father, Matthew 5. You do that by proclaiming the gospel and loving your persecutors and showing kindness to them. You do that by doing good by having a passion for goodness and by being willing to suffer. That message, my friends, next week we're going to look at we've got to focus on Christ. We've got to keep the eternal glory, looking to eternal glory and keeping your conscience pure. That's where we're headed next week. No way I could do justice to the remainder of these verses in the time in which we have. But my friends, that message that I just preached just now is so radical in America because it's so foreign to us. But the truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, make today that day. Trust Him as your Savior. Christ came and He lived a perfect life and He died for our sins on the cross so that his perfect record, so that we could have eternity in heaven through what Christ did. But if you know Christ as your Savior, Christian, listen to me. This is the biblical way to live. And the reason why it's so radical is because we don't always live it. And we've been blessed to not always have to display this. But it's coming go to bed, right? I get it, but it's coming. But you have been given Christ. Remember, Christ is so much more than just an example. Christ is your substitute. And Christ, when he was threatened, when he was reviled, when he was evil spoken about, when he was persecuted, when he was beaten, then respond in a hateful, vengeful type of way. And according to chapter 2, he now lives inside of you so you can live the way that you're being called to live. So I'm actually not, listen to me, 
I'm actually not asking you to do something that you're not capable of doing if you're a Christian. You're fully capable of doing it. What we have to do is we have to allow the Holy Spirit be unleashed in our life so we can live the way that we have been called to live. I told you, nothing nothing super fancy. It's a passion for goodness, living what we know is right, and that could help you not get harmed, but there's no guarantee. It's harder to harm someone that's being good, but if you get harmed for your righteousness sake, if you get harmed for your goodness sake, we've got to be willing to suffer for that type of suffering. Again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but if it's because we're suffering because of decisions we've made, that's on us. And we're going to have to pray for <laughs> extra grace to make through what, what really is something that we brought upon ourselves. And so Christian, listen, I tried to give you some examples of just literally the last kind of month and a half in our world. And there's many others, right? But it it's getting faster and faster, more and more and more. And we're seeing it come to our shores in different ways. And so we've got to prepare ourselves to be able to suffer well and to have hope, right, in Christ that he's in control, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relinquish all this. Chapter 2, I'm going to relinquish it to the one that is just because he will bring perfect justice someday. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, you know my heart, and my heart is one that I fall so short in what I just preached. (laughs) And yet I'm thankful that my great high priest, I'm thankful that my advocate, the great son, Jesus Christ, our king, our savior, that he lived perfectly for me. And God, I'm resting in his righteousness this morning. And Lord, I'm asking for the power to be unleashed. More so, God, let me unleash it so that I can live with this hope amongst hostility. That, God, I would have a life that is passionate for good and for right. And that, God, if that brings about suffering, Lord, may we Count that as being worthy to suffer like Christ suffered. And Lord, I just ask that you would take this message, that you would move it into everyone's lives the way that you need to. God, there's there's people here that have such different, different needs this morning. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would have spoken to them. Lord, I don't apologize for preaching your word. And Lord, I pray that you would use it for your honor and for your glory. And we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, thank you for allowing me to preach a uh, message, the the text. We're going to be there uh, again next week. So if no one shows up next week, I know why. I'm just kidding. I know you will. Um, But thank you. Thank you for allowing me to just kind of go through books of the Bible. There's a hunger in our, our church, and honestly, it's it's grown since COVID, uh, for truth and for and for what is right. And I want to thank you because that goes to uh, to you all and to your walk. One announcement that I did not make uh, earlier today is that we are um, pack. We mentioned it last week. We're packing shoe boxes once again for Operation Christmas Child, and you can uh, turn those in uh, uh, even uh, this week, next week, and even the week. Um, to, to, to come, but there we've got uh, stuff back there. We've got boxes, and there's directions on what you can put in those boxes. It's just a great, great opportunity to be able to uh, just uh, reach into countries where uh, the gospel hasn't quite got there yet. Some of them, and for these children to open up a Christmas box, a gift for the very first time, maybe, and uh, they are presented with the gospel. There's teams there that share the gospel, and they take these young people through discipleship. It's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. So uh, I'd encourage you to, uh, if you need some uh, information, it's at the back table there, and you can pack that uh, over the next couple weeks. If you have children, it's a great opportunity for the children to give back uh, to uh, to really to really the world. And so thank you for allowing me to uh, to be your pastor. I hope you have a wonderful, uh, wonderful 
wonderful afternoon and that you did enjoy that extra hour of sleep. And uh, maybe we'll feel it later uh, this afternoon. But God bless you. You are dismissed.